Hey guys, welcome to Grace Bible Church. If you want to stand with us, let's start our service. Grace Bible Church. We're glad you're here today. I'd like to um, give you a few announcements today. Before we get too much into the announcements, however, we'd like to welcome back Sam Roniker. <laughs> Sam just returned from three months of serving in Qatar, working on the RC-135. A lot of you have seen these, even if you don't know you've seen them. If you're at all near off it, a lot of times they'll, they're the ones that do the touch and goes, right? Yeah, so uh, the whole family was on quarantine the past two weeks, and they're all back with us today, and don't greet them if they're coughing. But we're glad you're back, Sam, so glad you're home. Quench, Lifetime, and Level Up are our youth and young adult groups. They're going to be meeting after church today with pizza once again. Say moms, just a reminder to get signed up for the new group Moms of Grace. It's for moms with kids of all ages, diapers to diplomas. I think it may be my favorite phrase there. I love that. Chelsea Schlesinger is the coordinator of the group. Chelsea, would you stand up, please? And if you would like to be a part of that group, see her or go to the information table and sign up for that. Another group that meets here is called Seams for a Cause. And Seams for a Cause will be meeting next Saturday, 1030 to 4 at Paula's, making pillowcases for the Open Door Mission. Paula, are you here today? And then, but they can talk to you, Michelle, right? So see Michelle or go to the information table. Whether you have sewing skills or not, you are welcome. They do a lot of great projects. And they have a table set up today if you would like to stop by to let them know. 
you'll be coming in or if you have any questions for them. So Seems for a Cause, it's called. Then the men, uh, one of the new men's ministries is called Grace's Garage, and it's a widow's ministry specifically uh, designed to um, help serve the widows in our church. And Rob is going to be coordinating that. Rob, would you stand up? Where are you today? Rob is going to be coordinating that if you're willing to serve or at the information table. You get applause, Rob. That's good. Yeah. He stand. Just one time, Rob. Just stand up one time. <laughs> Everybody, please mark your calendars. Friday the 30th of October is going to be our first ever harvest party. And there's going to be a lot of... <laughs> Apparently you're excited about that, and there's going to be some details coming about that. Is this what we talked about, this whole, this big celebration festival thing? Yeah, this is going to be fun. I'll tell you, we've got some very bright people in this church, so excited about this. Um, we're going to be putting together our final plans for the new church home, and we're thinking about a baptismal service. And uh, I said to the board, should we have a baptismal service? And they said, well, it seems like it's a slam dunk. So uh, we want to be able to do that. And if you are interested in baptism, please see Julie. Let us know at the information table. There'll be a sign-up seat. If you've never been baptized as a believer, we would love to have you take part in that. And we're going to be doing birthdays and an anniversary, but we also want to say a special hello this morning. How many of you know and remember Ed and Gail Parsons? Raise your, yeah, a lot of you. That's good. Um, they're going to be, they watch us each Sunday, Sunday from Glendale, Arizona, and uh, they miss you all. And so I wonder if you'd turn to the camera and say hi to Ed and Gail. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate that. Appreciate that very much. Birthdays. On the 8th of September, in the midst of many denials, yet we know Claire Hartford's going to be having a birthday. Happy birthday, Claire. <laughs> and then Jason Plummer has one on the 9th. Happy birthday, Jason. Alex Roniger will be 15 on the 10th of September. And then on the 11th, Doug Tweed has a birthday. So happy birthday, Doug, too. Anniversaries, 21 years on the 11th, Mike and Kathy Terman. Happy anniversary, all of you. Um, we do not have a formal offering that we take up. Many of you know that, but we do have a box in the back if you'd like to leave something today. And we also encourage you to either, if you'd like to, on a regular basis, give, which we would appreciate. Um, many of us will deduct things simply from our bank account or use Venmo. We have a Venmo ac accessibility to a Venmo app, so um, you can use that too. Uh, Dave Slessiger. Well, in fact, the whole board, Dave and Rick, Russ, come on up, guys. Aren't we doing, a, are we doing the update today or no? Okay, good. I thought that's the case. We, Dave, I think I need a microphone. Let me get that for you guys. Thanks, Dave. I should tell you these things. We want to give an update on where things are going, and uh, David, tell us how it's going. Okay, first of all, um, we want to thank everybody for the cleanup and tear down all that stuff. We haven't had any more work days because the one we did have had such a good turnout and then we had volunteers actually take time off work and do a lot of work. So right now everything is pretty much done as far as what we can currently do. Uh, we met this week with uh, the head architect and we should be getting our final plans early next week so once we get those he will file the uh, plans and we should get the permits two to four weeks, Praying two to four weeks. Praying for two. yes they're telling us the permits could be two to four weeks so once we get the permits the construction will start we did meet with the construction people this week uh, got them in there, they did a good walkthrough, kind of got a plan set up so that once the permits come in, they have everything set up, they know what they're going to be doing. He did tell us, uh, talking to Russ and I, he said he, he doesn't like to not meet his goal, so he said 30 days, 
but then he also said it could very much be closer to 20 days. So depending on how quickly we get the permits is how quickly we get into the building. Uh, with that being said, we did walk through, tell them everything, you know, moving out the wall, all that kind of stuff, so they are aware of everything that we want done through phase one and one B or whatever. Um, with that said, we also wanted to kind of let everybody know that if you've read the newsletters, our monthly budget went from like 159 to 20,500. So we want to first encourage everybody that giving has been very good. We've been meeting our goal, uh, doing a great job with meat and budget. Uh, we don't want that to scare anybody that, you know, we're really in a pinch right now. We, when we made the move, we, as a board, discussed that it could take a while to hit that new budget. And we have money in reserve that we figured we would be using in the meantime to make up the difference. So again, we encourage the giving. Uh, it has been great. And, you know, if we don't meet that new goal right away, that's fine. That is also projected down the road as we move into the building and grow. We don't think that new budget's going to be an issue at all. Um, one other thing, as we do start doing some of the build-out things, we will probably bring it to the congregation and see if people want to give towards certain things. Um, we discussed like the sign that we're putting up on the outside of our building. Uh, Allie's kind of in charge of that. She's getting a price on that to see how much that's going to cost. When, what's that? Oh. <laughs> so as we get those informations, we'll probably let you know, you know, if people want to give a one-time offering to the sign or whatever. If it costs us, I don't know, $10,000, you know, maybe somebody has that in the bank that they want to do it. We'll, we'll just provide it. and. Again, going forward, we have the money in the reserve to take care of these kinds of things, too. So we will try to keep you guys in the loop as much as we can. And as we get more information, we will make sure we're sharing it. Everything in? All right. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys. Each week we like to begin and end our service with the taking of the bread in the beginning and then the taking of the cup later as a way to remember the Lord and what he's done for us. Paul tells us that before we take the cup and the bread that we should examine ourselves. And so we like to take about a minute, I have silent prayer together to make sure our hearts are right with God. If you don't know, you have everlasting life. We would love to tell you how you can know. If you do, well, this is a great time to get your heart right with God as oftentimes can be necessary. And so let's take that moment just to pray for one another and then we'll take the bread together. Let's pray. Father, you said in your word that the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that we do not do the things we wish. Boy, is that true, Father. I pray today that uh, you'll honor your son by giving us the grace to set our hearts on the things of the spirit, to be spiritually minded today, that we might learn and be instructed both from your word and from music, encourage one another. And Father, that we might honor Jesus. Our world is increasingly in turmoil, and it's very clear that Satan is alive and well. But you're greater, and I pray that you'd bring peace not only to our hearts, but to this world that should grant repentance for the many who need it. And sadly, unfortunately, that often involves us. So thank you for your grace and mercy and forgiveness. Thank you for what this bread represents in Christ's name. Amen. The men on each side will direct you to the table so you can take uh, the bread this morning.
Thank you, Allie. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the concept of love languages and that different people love with different emphases and they also receive love different ways. This was brought out to me in a pretty dramatic fashion with my father when I was younger. I was still living at home and my father and I had an argument as sometimes sons and dads do. And we were talking about the fact that growing up I had been frustrated that dad was not a very verbal person. And I, in the midst of our conversation, I said something to the effect of, you know, you don't say you love me. And my father was not a very emotional man, but he got a little bit hurt, I could tell, a little bit emotional. And he said something like this to me, never said I love you. He said, your entire life, I fed you, I clothed you, I gave you a place to stay, I always took care of you. How can you say to me that I didn't love you? And it occurred to me that I had been very, very ungrateful because I had been looking for the wrong things from my dad. I had been looking for things like verbal affirmation, and my father had been taking care of me, had been giving gifts. That was his love language. And so today, as we come to Ephesians chapter 3 at the end, I wonder this, when it comes to you and to God, do you live life in an appreciative way? Do you live a life of appreciation? Are you a grateful person? Do you have eyes that see what you should see? Because Ephesians 3 talks about it. Let's take a look together a little bit at this today. And I want first to just do an overview of the book because we're coming to the end of what is the first major section in the book. And so in terms of just a simple outline, guys, this is what Ephesians presents to you. First, in chapters 1 to 3, Paul gives you doctrine, teaching truths, uh, important about you. And then in chapters 4 to 6, he does, has a section on duty where he emphasizes not uh, just the teaching but the duty that comes from that. And then another way to look at it is position in chapters 1 to 3 and then in chapters 4 to 6, practice. And a third way, very similar, who you are in Christ in chapters 1 to 3 and then in chapters 4 to 6, how you should live. Position, practice, doctrine, duty, who you are, how you should live. So we're coming to the end of the first major section of the book, and that is basically been talking about who you are. It talks about your position in Christ, all that he's done for you. Now, we are coming to the end of a section that is actually, even in English, known with a formal word that I'll bet you've used in a sentence this week. The word is inclusio. And you're probably thinking, wow, I've used that four or five times this week. Uh, inclusio is, is kind of like this, guys. He begins a section with something, and he ends a section with the same thing. It's sort of like parentheses. That's why those parentheses are up there. He's wrapping up. So this is Paul's literary sandwich, if you will. You might say, well, it seems like a lot of baloney to me. It's not. It's really good. So he starts with blessing God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he praises God because God has given us all we need to successfully wage spiritual warfare. Then at the end of this section, he says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And then he gives praise to God because he's given us things we couldn't have imagined. So that wraps it up. In the middle are all the blessings that he's been talking about. So he starts off, he's given you all you need. He ends with, thank God that he's given us all this. And in the middle, he gives you the details, and we're going to talk about those details today. So part two, then, is an overview of this section today. It's really a short section, but it's talk, he talks about the prayer, the presence, and the power. Paul gives a prayer. He talks about the presence of Christ in our life and the power that's available to us. In this prayer, he talks about the presence of God in our lives and the power that's available to us. So here we go. Ephesians 3, 14 to 17a, the first part of the verse. Paul says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. And he's talking about the family of God. God is the Father of the family of God. And so he prays to the head of the family, to the Father, and uh, talks about uh, what he wants God to do, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that word dwell means to have a home 
in your heart. He's in there. He's in the life of every believer. His prayer is that he's going to turn a house into a home. That's what he's talking about here. And then he goes on and says that you, being rooted and grounded in love, by the way, for some reason the translations use that, being rooted, it, it's, it's a particular verb that means having been rooted. Having been, again, passive par, uh, perfect tense. And you're going, man, again, I've talked about the passive perfect all week long, so you're right in line with it. May be able to comprehend with all the saints. And then he uses a figure of speech, what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. He's saying the vast extent of the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of of God. It's like he pictures the love of God like a Pacific Ocean of love and says, hey, take a drink. Go ahead and take several drinks. I want you to get an idea how big it is. So let's talk about some details. There's four goals in this section. Paul's prayer is one that we would be strengthened. Why? Because the flesh wars against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. You're not able to do the things you please. So we need to be strengthened because the flesh wins. Second, that Christ and his word would have a home in us. That's what Paul's prayer is. I want Jesus to be at home in your lives. Third, he wants us to continue to learn of the vastness of Christ's love, which can never be fully known. You know, as an older man, I've been saved for a number of years now, you know what I'm learning the most about lately? The love of God. Because it's so vast, it's so big. You never, never tap it out. And then finally, that we would manifest Paul, uh, God's character. And I made a note there that's plural. The you that he's writing to is the church. As a body of Christ, are you aware that the body of Christ can manifest the person of God to people? 1 John 4, 12 says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. Same idea. And his Truth is perfected in us. His love is perfected in us. So people don't see God when Grace Bible Church loves one another. God is manifested to others in our midst. People see God through us. So that's that. What Paul's talking about is he wants you to know something that can never be fully known. So it's kind of like a stair step from the bottom up. At the bottom, Paul prays to the head of the family, God the Father, that the Spirit would strengthen our inner being. How's that happen? How does the Spirit of God strengthen us in the inner person? Well, basically, it starts with, it's, of course, a supernatural aspect, but it's more than that. It also is the things he's taught you in chapters 1 to 3. How is it that he can strengthen you? Well, as you learn truth, remember, to present your body as a living sacrifice, right? How do you do that? You set your mind on the things of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God makes dead, uncooperative bodies alive. So I'm in God's Word. I'm living God's Word. I'm obeying it. But as I set my mind on the things of the Spirit, I'm dependent on the Lord. He gives life to my dead, uncooperative body. And as he does that, Paul says, take that body now that he's made alive and present it a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove to yourself and to others what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how you realize it in your life. And so he strengthens us so that Christ and his word will be at home in our lives so that we who already understand God's love, after all, if you believed in Christ, you understand he's died for you. You understand his great love. We who already understand that love would further know the extent of his love because as I live by faith in what Paul's taught me in chapters 1 through 3, as I live by faith, I, I say, man, God, you've loved me so much. We're going to talk about that. And as I live by faith, uh, day to day, I keep experiencing new ways, new experiences where I'm stressed out, about this or that, and as I'm stressed out, I see his love for me, and then we increasingly know the love we cannot exhaust. You can't exhaust God's love. That's the process of Christian living, is to continue to learn about God's love. So part three, let's talk about some of the details here. We've looked at an overview of the book, overview of this section. Here's some of the details of 
314 and following, he blesses God. He says, for this reason, based on the new family the Father has created, this church, and that he's building us into his home, based on that, I, I, this is my favorite Halloween costume, I think, that I found. This has got this big arm, and you're, there's a person inside of you that's powerful, Right? And uh, I've noticed mine's trying to come out, but not so far. It hasn't come out. But you've got this powerful person, and God wants to transform you. And he says, according to the riches of his glory, that he would strengthen. What are the riches of his glory? Guys, part of that we've seen in chapters 1 to 3. And we're going to talk about all those glorious things he's revealed to us, that he would strengthen us with power by his spirit in the inner man. That's a perfect you that's in there that Christ may have a home in our hearts by faith. So here's the point. The strengthening that he talks about is this. First, it's according to the riches of his glory. Now, that means that he taps into all that he is to make you all you can be. It's according to the riches of his glory. He does it with power. Now, most of you have heard this before, but the Greek word for power is dunamis from where we get our word dynamite. And so there's a, a power that he wants to use in your life. He does it by his spirit, and he does it in the inner person. So this is a, pray, a prayer that I try to remember to pray daily. And I pray for you as well. And when I pray, I pray for our fellowship, that God, according to the riches of his glory, will strengthen us with might through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ may have a home in our hearts through faith. So that's our inner person, because for me, Unlike maybe some of you, I don't roll out of the bed in the morning and think, man, can't wait to read my Bible and pray. That's all I think about. Normally, my day has started off my natural inclination to think about what I have to do, why I didn't go to bed earlier, things like that. Well, he, so I pray that he will strengthen us, incline our hearts that way, because we do not naturally incline that way. I don't, I'm sorry about that's not very Christian-y, but that's the way it is. So the goal is this. The goal is first that Christ would have a home in our hearts. We're going to talk about what that means. But he's comfortable there. He's comfortable there. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And that this would happen by faith. That's how Paul lives. So let's talk a little bit about that. A home in our hearts is where Jesus is at home in a life where the truths Paul taught are embraced and lived. And here's the point. God is never at home where there's sin and rebellion. He's not talking about getting an ushy-gushy feeling. He's saying, look, take the truths I've taught you and live them out. And Jesus will be comfortable in your life. He says living by faith is, is living by revealed truth. Much of that involves living according to what Paul's taught in the first three chapters. You don't think that he just came out of nowhere, do you? At the end of chapter 3, he said, hey, take what I've just taught you and live it. And when you do that, God's going to be at home in your heart. Paul lived by faith. You remember it, don't you? Peter, remember when Peter copped out and he was eating with the Gentiles and then the guys came from James and all of a sudden Peter said, I don't want to hang out with these guys. So he stopped eating with the Gentiles and Paul faced him down at apparently the Lord's Supper, scolded him and then Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, Peter. This is how I live. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live how? By faith in the Son of God. And then he adds, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. That's critical. Here's why. He mentions that love is an important aspect of faith. In Galatians 5, 6, he says, neither is circumcision nor uncircumcision anything, but faith working through love. You say, well, how does that work? Are there people that you pray for more than others? Because you love them. What motivates us, what drives us is love in our Christian life. And it's very difficult. I've said this before, but I want to keep saying it. It's difficult to trust someone if you don't think they love you. And if you know they love you, you're going to be inclined to trust them. That's why this is such a critical conversation. And so the first three chapters should help ground us in love. And you're going to see why in a moment. But the, I've gotten 21 things together. I put it in your sheet so you wouldn't have to write them down because I like you. To give you an idea of what we're talking about today, guys, because we want to summarize this. So as we live based on this, we continue to see how he loves us. That's the practical side of this. Paul wasn't just rambling. Paul didn't sit down and say, I think I'll write a book of the New Testament. 
Paul's writing to people he loves to say, look what Jesus has done for you. Why? So you'll get an idea of the vastness of his love. And so we never exhaust it. Never exhaust the love of God. To live by faith, we need to know God's word. Because this, people, faith is very misunderstood. People will kind of make something up and they'll say, I'm going to believe God for it. It'd be like a little kid from the neighborhood who I don't know walking up and saying, I want you to know I trust you to give me $500. And I would say, son, your faith is placed in the wrong person for the wrong thing. I never told you I'd give you $500. It ain't going to happen. We trust God for things he's told us in his word. It is hard to believe God for something that, that we don't know. If you don't know his word, how can you believe him for it? And secondly, it's hard to believe God for things that he hasn't said. We hold a God accountable for the weirdest things. So we need to know his word so we know what he says and we know how we can trust him. What would that look like in your life? You say, well, that's really, yeah, it's great stuff. What's that look like in your life? If what I just said is true, you need to be in the word. And if you need to be in the word, what are you going to do to adjust your life to make sure that happens? Because there's not a person in this room who hasn't heard or said this phrase. Yeah, how are you doing in the scriptures? Well, I'm really not reading as much as I should be. How's your prayer life? I'm really not praying as much as I should be. Okay, wonderful confession. So we should start reading as we should be and praying. You say, well, how much is that? You, you make it a priority in your life. Yeah, that's, that's your conscience, you know. Make it a priority in your life. What's that look like? So let's, let's now spend some time talking about my favorite part of this message, some of the lessons we learn from chapters one to three. Let's look at some of the lessons we've learned. Okay, here we go. I put that up there because I love this picture. I don't know where it is. I want to move there. I want to move to a rock by water. So God's great love has done this, 21 things in your sheets. He's given us every spiritual resource we need, Ephesians 1, 3. At the end of the book, what's he tell you? Your battle isn't against flesh and blood. It's against powers and principalities and so on. Angelic authorities. That's where your battle is. He's given us all we need. Secondly, he's chosen both Jew and Greek to be in him in the church. Now, don't just let these things go up here. Let it get in here. Because this is what God, Jesus has done for you. He's, he chose us to be together in the church. Before the foundation of the world, God elected the Jews and then later the Gentiles to be in a thing called the church. He had a plan. It wasn't just random. He has predestined us to an unconditional inheritance. He took you without hope, without God in the world. He took you and gave you a destiny. And so you can say to God, you are my density, you know. But he gave us a, a destiny in Christ, an unconditional inheritance. He purchased us. God bought you. The Bible says that God bought you with the blood of Christ. You're his. He owns you. And he forgave us in Christ. If we stop there, that's amazing. But it doesn't begin to stop there. He sealed us in the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He put a seal on you to make sure you arrive at your destination. And all the powers of hell can't break that seal. And then he also gave us the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a guarantee. That's what the Bible teaches. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of eternity. Next, God's great love has given us much more than eternal life. That's what he says in his prayer. He says, I want you to understand, God didn't just give you a ticket to heaven. He gave you an inheritance with the king of kings. This crazy, messed up, garbage-strewn world is going to be done someday. And Jesus Christ is going to come back. And as sure as you're breathing and more, Jesus Christ will reign. He will make things right. And he's going to give us what we've always dreamed of. God's power raised and seated Jesus far above angelic powers. He gave him life. He raised him. He put him far above all rule and authority and dominion and power and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the kingdom. That's where Jesus is. But if you notice, and he gave us life, raised us up, and seated us with him. You have been placed in the king of kings forever. He gave us, he gave those who believe in Christ a by grace salvation because theologically speaking, just to get real technical, in the Greek and Hebrew, we're a mess. 
And God gave us a by grace salvation as a gift. And if you've gotten over it, may God give us grace to open our eyes. He will forever present us as trophies of his grace. Forever you'll be marked out as part of the church, a unique body, never to be repeated. Trophies of his grace. He's going to parade you around. Those of you that live faithful will have white robes. Many of us will have crowns. We'll have markings. We'll have distinguishing characteristics. And forever, the billions and billions of angels, members of the nation, Israel and so on, will look and say, that's part of the church. It's one of God's. Forever will be marked out that way. The Bible said he made us, his church, as a masterpiece. And he created us to do good works in the world. So we are collectively a masterpiece, not individual. God's great love brought the Gentiles who without hope, he said you're without hope, without God in the world, he brought us near. He grabbed you and pulled you close to him. And then the Bible says he destroyed the separating of wall, the separating wall of the law. The law, you know what that means? Bacon. We can have bacon. I mean, you think about it. If there's that constant, you know the philosophical question, don't you? The real struggle. Is baking bread better or frying bacon? It's just such, and we'll know in eternity, God will give us answers to things like that. The Bible says he has reconciled both Jew and Gentile believers to God. He's reconciled us. He, reconciled, he's, he's changed the barrier. We're good with God now. Bible says that he is building the family of God into his dwelling place, the church of Jesus Christ, so he could be comfortable with us as we learn these truths. Bible says he's made peace between Jew and Gentile. He's created what the Bible calls a new man. The new man is the church. It's not us, it's the church. We have this new person that's been created. Both Jew and Gentile believers are part of God's family. God is your father. And that's why a lot of times I had nothing wrong with praying and saying, dear God, nothing wrong with that. You know what I love to say? Father. Jesus said when you pray, you should say, our father who are in heaven, who's in heaven. Heavenly father. God is your father. We hear it so much. It's kind of a deadness, right? He's your father. You're his child. Bible says this. By the way, I know this is long. I don't care. We're going to keep going. The Bible says he's addressed failure. He reserved and then he revealed the mystery of the church. While Israel was failing and everything was unraveling, the Lord sits there in control because in his back pocket he knew that as Jesus was suffering death, as Jesus was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Satan was doing a jig and thinking, I got it, I got it, I won. The Lord knew something was coming that nobody had ever heard of. Not the angels, no human being. There was a church ready to take over. And he reserved this in the back. He had control. And today, I don't know how you react. I watch some commercials on television and I just do a slow burn sometime at distortions that I see day after day after day, when I know people know better. And I, get, I have struggles. But I remember this, that God knew the mystery was ready. He's got this. And he made Jew and Gentile of equal standing in the church. We're together in the body of Christ now. We're the people of God, joint heirs. We're, we're heirs with God. And he has everything under control. Paul says, I know I'm in jail I know it bothers you. You feel like I'm in jail and the whole thing's unraveled. I'm telling you that this is part of God's eternal purpose. He's got this. And I keep praying for things that aren't happening in America. You too? You know why they're not happening? Because God is answering our priority prayer. Because one of my priorities is this. Lord, bring your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes God's got to say no to these so he can say yes to this. Our Father is in control. This country is not flying apart. This world is not unraveling without our Father knowing exactly what he's doing, exactly where this is going. And so Paul's in jail. And like in Philippians, they say, Paul, you're in jail. We gave you money. You're a missionary. It's all messed up. And Paul writes back and they say, you're in jail. And he goes, yeah, isn't it great? the palace guards here in the gospel. How else was that going to happen? They say, but Paul, there's guys that are bad guys that are preaching the gospel. He goes, I don't care. 
As long as the gospel's being preached, let them do it for whatever reason they want. But Paul, you may die. And he goes, isn't that great? I may die. I'm so excited about that because that's very much better. I'm jailed up. You think it's falling apart. God has got this world and he's got it in control. And then Paul tells us that we should embrace these truths as we embrace what we just talked about, as we live day to day saying, I've been redeemed, I'm in Christ, I'm sealed in the spirit. God loved for me, paid for me, he died. As we review these truths, Christ is comfortable with us because he can't be at home with sin and rebellion. But you've got to embrace this. You've got to embrace this. This is your praise list. This is something you can take with you and say, Father, thank you that on a day where I'm frustrated at Republicans or Democrats or whoever I'm frustrated with, this is you. This is your world. This is my Father's world. His love for us, Paul says, is beyond comprehension. Why does he say the height and depth and width and length? Why does he talk like that about love? He's using a figure of speech to say it's big. The love of God which is beyond comprehension. He has and can do more for us than we can imagine. We're going to look at that in a moment. But the last part is just kind of an epilogue we want to look at. What a great God we serve. Look what he says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. I love it. It's like he's almost running out of words. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? He doesn't say he can do more than you can think of. He he doesn't say he can do exceedingly more. He says he can do exceedingly, abundantly more than you ask or think. You say, oh, come on, what are you even talking about? Tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that were distant from God, had no hope, and God said, tell you what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to give you a by grace salvation that bypasses you and your failures. I'm going to put you together in the church of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to give you an unconditional inheritance in my center. When my kingdom comes, you're going to reign and rule with Jesus Christ. How's that for a surprise? And I'm going to give you the Spirit as a guarantee. I'm going to seal you in the Spirit. I'm going to give you a down payment in the Spirit now so you know that it's going to happen. God can do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond. Who would have thought this? He not only isn't sending us to hell, we're going to reign with Jesus. Are you kidding me? It's kind of good. Pardon me that I'm a little excited. I think it's kind of good. And so he says, he says, according to the power that works in us, You say, well, how do I know the power worked? When you believed, he raised you up with the Son of God far above all angelic power. That's the power that works in you. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And one of the shortcomings of church is that we're all around each other. We don't want to look silly. But you know that our God deserves to be honored and praised. And man, if you can't praise him for what we just looked at, something's very, very wrong here. I love it in Exodus, after the Red Sea's been parted and they watched one of the mightiest nations on earth, an army that was chasing them, about to destroy them, and they watched them drowned when God just stand there. I'll take care of it. And he parts the Red Sea and then destroys this mighty army. They say this, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders. Who's like your God? And people tell me, you know, I'm thinking about other religions and I'm thinking, really? Why? Why take a step down? Who else gives you a by grace salvation? Who else places you in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Who else gives you an inheritance in the kingdom? Who else forgives your sins? Who else buys you, purchases you, guarantees you eternal life? Who is like our God? There is no God like our God. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you'll receive great glory for the great things you have done. You alone are worthy. We're not. We were without you with no hope at all in the world. You pulled us out. You made us alive when we believed. You gave us a by grace salvation. You sealed us in the spirit. You gave us a guarantee. You made us co-heirs with Jesus Christ in the kingdom and seated us with him far above all rulers and powers and principalities and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And when it looked like it was unraveling at the beginning of the church and Paul was in prison, Paul encouraged us that this is all part of your eternal purpose. 
And as we look at this world and our hearts are discouraged, we say this, Father, you've got this. God, you've got this. I pray that you'll be honored in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Band, come on up and lead us in some singing. You guys want to stand with us? Let's worship.
We want to end service uh, similar to the way we began it today by honoring the Lord with remembering his death. So we're going to be taking the cup in just a moment. Uh, the guys, once again, will direct you as to how you should exit your, your seating area. Then we have a quick announcement before our last song today. So let's pray and let's thank the Lord for the cup today. Our Father, I, I have to say that um, when I look at your word, what you taught us and chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians, um, it is exciting, and it is a reflection of your great love for us. It can't be tapped out, and I just thank you so much for that. I pray that you'll excite our hearts for truth and reality that when we're down, we'll run home to your word, we'll run home to truth, and we'll rest in it. I pray that your son will be honored today as we remember that this cup represents a blood that purchased us and that we receive forgiveness of sins for it. In Christ's name, amen. Gentlemen. Song today. Uh, we just want to make one other announcement. It's really possible, unfortunately, to look at the church just as an organization. And that some of the things we do here as a drudgery instead of an outworking of what Paul taught us today. And we have some brilliant people in our church, especially a group of ladies that have been working hard in our education department. And Chelsea, I wonder if you'd come up here a minute. Tell us a little bit about something that all of you brilliant people have been planning together. I loved reading about it and got excited myself. So just share a little bit about what you have planned and some details of it for it. So we are going to be having a fall festival this year called Fallapalooza. And it's going to be a little bit different under the current circumstances but what we're hoping to have is a trunk or treat which is 
um, decorated car trunks that have candy in it and kids can go trick-or-treating. We're hoping to have games with prizes and candy, um, a free dinner, and also a gospel presentation. So we're hoping it will be an outreach to the community, letting them know that um, our church is here and we're wanting to have a safe, fun, family-friendly event. Sounds great. Is this, now, the way, I'm, I want to make sure I understand, is this a celebration of Halloween or is it an alternative to it? What are you guys thinking? It's an alternative. Alternative. So it's a, a yeah. fall event. Yeah. It's a fall party. So instead of Halloween, we're still going to do an alternative to it, but the sugar high is still available. Oh, right? yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And costumes. Costumes are welcome yeah. as long as they're family friendly, nothing scary. Um, but. Yeah. And there will be security guards by the trunk of the car, just in case some of you adults think you're getting in on it. So, Yes, and we just want to encourage everyone in the congregation um, to get involved. Uh, we're going to need volunteers to run games, um, to be a part of the dinner crew, uh, to decorate the trunks, pass out candy. And Allie is going to be creating a Facebook event on Grace's page. So we would welcome you to um, invite friends, invite family, those in the community, and be sure to RSVP um, because we're gonna need to get an idea of how many people are coming. Um, one of our local grocery stores, um, hy V, has graciously donated all the supplies for dinner. So um, we don't have to financially provide that so we're very very grateful for hy V, and um, we just want to be able to kind of figure out how many hot dogs and chips and pop we need to get from them so i wish you could see what i saw when i saw the organization sheets of organization for putting this together i'm really excited about it i think it's going to be great and i hope that you'll throw yourselves into it in the sense of really w willing to help and you know if you really work hard it might give you some candy too so yes. yeah <laughs> good let's sing all right let's sing if you guys want to stand Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout. For us soon his beauty will be whole. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Lots of teardown help needed the next few weeks, and please stop by the information table to sign up for baptism and other activities. Have a good week.